Alrighty, Captain. So today we're looking at a slightly different timer to the one we looked at a few weeks ago. Um, this one's used mainly for uh, like a corporate um, speaker timer, uh, something where you need to be able to manually set the time. It's not going to rely on a clock. So what you'll notice here um, is the the countdown timer and the border, the colors have just changed. So when there's more than 30 seconds to go, it'll be green. Um, when there's more than 10 seconds left, it'll be yellow like it is now. Less than 10 seconds left, it's going to go red, and you'll see once it hits down to zero, it'll actually start flashing in red. Um, and the reason behind this is this is designed uh, primarily to get the attention of someone like on a downstage monitor that their time speaking is up. Um, so this is how this has kind of originally been thought out. So while it's flashing, uh, we'll show you we do have the ability to control the flash speed. We can turn that up or slow it all the way down. Um, I'm just going to press stop here. So going from the top in, we have the play button, it does what you think it does. Pause button pauses it, so you can resume playing. Uh, stop will actually take you all the way back up to the start, so you can press play again. And the restart, no matter where you are, will restart it back from whatever value you've set. So pressing stop here. Um, we've got the hours, minutes, and seconds. So normally this would probably be set for something like a two-minute countdown or a five-minute countdown, and you'd basically let a speaker talk for that amount of time. Um, but there, you can go all the way up to 48 hours. Um, for some reason, I left it at that. So let's just say we're going to put it as a five-minute countdown and just let it run down in the background. So coming down further below here, we have the options for the border. So we have the option to turn off the border if we want, so it's just the, the countdown. Bring the border back in, and we also have a border thickness. So depending on if you want that there or not, that's an option. Um, alternatively, if you are feeding this out into a video switcher and you don't say you don't have a background, you just want to actually send this timer out. As this is an effect, you can just drag it into an empty space. Um, because alpha won't be um, carried over as a video signal, I've left it where you can put a color fill in. So you can come in and choose any color. Uh, in this particular um, version, actually a solid blue would work well against all three of those colors. Um, but I've just used magenta as standard because it most of the time it'll be green and magenta is anti-green. Cool. So let's close that out. Uh, the next thing here, let's just jump back into the version that has the video running. Uh, we've got the text size. So we can shrink this down, make it larger. As you can see, it will clip into the sides. Uh, we've got character spacing. So if we did make it smaller, um, I've allowed it so you can spread the characters out or bunch them in tighter together. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have font control exposed in Wire, but eventually down the line, when I can add that back in, um, you'd be able to change the font and then re-kerning and re-leading all of your fonts. Uh, I've got line spacing in here as well. Uh, eventually, I'm going to put like a title above this so you can actually separate how far or close those are together. But at the moment, they're just set to zero. If I take the border off here, you can easily see that I've also got left, center, and right justifications. I left it in the center, and I've got manual control to move it left and right, move it up and down. Um, I've just got it set down the bottom uh, at pixel 400 at the moment, and 1.5 fills it into there. So let's throw the border back on. Uh, the last thing I have here is a drop shadow toggle, and that's basically just going to be on the text. As you can see here on fast moving text or bright text, sometimes it's hard to see, and that small bright drop shadow just brings it out and makes it much easier to read even if our text size is something that's much smaller. It just helps read that easy on a busy background. All right, the, the bottom section down here um, gives you the ability to, when this timer hits zero, that we can actually fire off an OSC um, command. So you put your address in here. Uh, there's a button at the top here, just the test OSC. You can actually fire that off just to check in your other program that it's working fine. Um, I've got the option down here to select between a float value. You want to send a value out or an integer to send a value out. Um, I've just got it set to one here for both of those so they can fire out. And that is currently how this particular timer looks. So let's jump across into wire and see how it's built. So before I do, I'm just going to take the video off of here. So now we're in wire. Um, as you can see, the inputs are the same. Uh, I'm just using the test card here if I play it. Uh, it's not quite as interesting, so because we're using a texture in, we can actually grab that feed from Arena and just put it in the background there. 
Let's just give us, say, four minutes there. All right, so this is quite a lot of nodes. Um, as usual, we've got most of our inputs in yellow. So anything in yellow you see around in here will all be an input. So the inputs are mainly on the side here. We have a section that's going to then feed our, set our timeline based along how many hours, minutes, and seconds we're adding in an arena. We are then saying, all right, we need to make the timeline count down. And we're going to feed those values into text strings for each one of these. So that's hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. We also have a section down the bottom dedicated to color control. So that'll be determining when these um, borders change color and the text changes color and what colors they change to. Uh, we have a border section in here that will just be controlling the on off of the border and the width, the background color fill, our final transform output and video mixing between all those layers and our OSC down the bottom here. So let's jump all the way in to the far left and start off here. So to set our timeline and controls, uh, normally when we're doing a lot of the other counters and timers of built-in wire, we've been using the time node. Um, but this time we're actually going to use a timeline. And the benefit of this is we can, let's just say stop this, we can come in and say we want to set a duration and we want to send an end value. And we can just say, and just start it, stop it. It's like an, an auxiliary timeline running inside of Regilum, which is really cool. So what we've got it set up as are a bunch of trigger ins over here, which correspond to all of the commands up the top here. We don't need a rewind. Um, we take our hours, our minutes and our seconds. We bring them into the graph here via our float ins. We've got a texture in down the bottom here, which we don't need to worry about just yet because that pretty much goes all the way to the end of the graph. So this add here is basically going to say, all right, we want to add our seconds. So seconds go directly in. We want to add our minutes. Now there are 60 um, seconds in a minute. So we're multiplying the minutes by 60. And then we want to bring in the hours. And there are 60 minutes in an hour. So 60 times 60 is 3,600. So we're timesing our hours by 3,600, adding all of those together. And that gives us the seconds value of our timer. So we come across here, we're actually feeding this seconds value into both the duration and the end value. Uh, the reason we do this, and the reason it's really cool that we can make this independent, is we could say that the duration is going to be the full 4 minutes and 35 seconds, but at the end value we could say it only was going to get to a value of 1. But because we're doing a timer, we want to be the end value being the same time. So we're feeding that in there. All right. Now we come to the point where we need to start counting down because this is obviously going to count up. If I press play and hover over here, you can see that's counting up. And that's not ideal for a, a, a countdown, as the name would say. So we're going to use a subtract node. And if you look over here, you can see this is actually counting down. The way we do this is we take our total number of seconds, feed it into the top of a subtract node. And from that, we actually subtract the value that's counting upwards towards that goal. So this will keep counting down until it reaches zero. And because our duration and our end value are the same, that'll just stop counting when it gets to zero, which is really cool. So this is still in seconds. We feed this into a time node. That'll then split out our hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. It just saves us doing a bunch of nodes for um, division to get that out. And we're using floors here. Main reason is uh, we don't need a decimal point uh, we just need to know if it is a single integer um, or if it's like a one is a one, not a 1.5, or we don't need to round it up with an int because you might see a 0.99 gets rounded up to a one, but we only need to know if it's a one or a two to 12, whatever. Okay, so we've now got our values. So we've got our hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. So we need to start converting these into strings. Now, the first thing we can look at here is Let's go into something like our seconds, which is down here. We've got eight seconds, seven, six, five. But what we have over here in our preview is we actually have the, the leading zero. And that's kind of important, especially for things like corporate world, where you, it's just much easier to read and it's much faster to get where you're going. Um, the idea of this counter here is at a quick glance, someone can look down and immediately see how many seconds or how many minutes is left. So we want to add that leading zero in. 
Um, there may be a faster way of doing this, but the one that works for me the most is actually using a less node. So we look at the value, say again, let's have a look at the minutes here. So you have two minutes. We're using a less node and we're checking to see if this incoming value is less than 10. All right? If it is, it's obviously only going to have one digit. So what we'll do is we'll get the string value of that, the in, turn it into a string. We're going to feed that into the right value here and we're going to add a zero in front of it. Now, I've never been able to pronounce this properly, but uh, concatenate, I guess. Concatenate? Concaten? Yes. Okay. Apologies. So basically what this is doing is just joining two strings together. We're just basically grabbing a zero and joining it directly into the front of this value over here. And we're running this into a gate. Um, so the top value is the one that's actually joined with a zero. And the bottom value, as you can see here, just runs directly from the string. And the reason we're doing this is if this less is true, so we're saying it is less than 10, this gate will say, all right, we're going to grab the true value, which is the one that has the leading zero. Otherwise, if it doesn't need a leading zero, it's going to feed that value straight in, which you can see here would be a one, but because we have a leading zero, it's not. And that's just coming into a hub. Um, and I like to use hubs, as I explained on another video, hubs function like nulls in touch designer and in notch. So you'll see me using a lot of hubs and I just label them as hub and whatever their value is sitting inside it. So this is for hours, again, for minutes, for seconds, but milliseconds is going to give us something slightly different. Um, again, I wanted to keep it so it's two digits, two, two digits, two digits, but milliseconds is going to give us three digits um, because it's literally a thousandth of a second. What we use to trim that back down is something called a substring node. Now this substring node actually tells us at what point of the string do we want to start, obviously the first character, and how many characters we're going to allow before it just chops it off. So it's a really good way of saying if you've got um, like an extension at the end of a file length that you know the length of and you just want to trim it off, definitely use it there. So we're basically saying out of the three values you're going to give us here, I want you to grab only the first two, and then that is going to become like our normal string. So we add a zero in front if we need to, or we don't with the gate. Feed that in. And here is another one of those merge nodes. We're basically grabbing the hours, then a space colon space, the minutes, space colon space, seconds, space colon space, milliseconds. And just on time, we're about to see this tick over to zero and it's starting to flash at us again. So let's just hit restart. All right. So now we've got our values as text strings. Let's jump a bit ahead in the graph. And we're just going to feed this value here, as you can see. We're going to feed it straight into a text render. Now, the text render has a bunch of other things that are inside it. Um, we have the line weight width here. What we do if we follow this line back, this is actually going to reach all the way back to our patch info. And that's going to basically grab our aspect ratio. Uh, sorry, not our aspect ratio. It is going to grab, sorry, our resolution. And it's going to unpack that and just grab the X. So the color disappears when I scroll across. So that's basically going to be in there, get our land width. Our alignment down here is going to be our center left and right down here, which is exposed. Our color is going to come from the color nodes, which we'll show down the bottom in a second. Spacing is going to be the uh, character and line spacing before, and the scale is going to be the text size, which we've also exposed in the inputs. Uh, this is then running into a transform, and that's allowing us to do the translation. That translation is exposed as our offset X and our offset Y. Um, and then we're doing a drop shadow. And this drop shadow happens here because we're only really applying it to the text or the, the numbers. We don't really need it on the border. Um, and what we're doing here is we've basically got a drop shadow here. We have a Boolean in that is feeding into a hub, just so I can see it from across the, the graph. So if, again, if I come all the way out here, that line will show you it's feeding all the way in from over here. I'm just running it into a hub. Sorry for the scrolling. Uh, running it into a hub here and into just a one take X. So just when that's a zero, um, it's one. And when it's a one, it's zero. And that's just so I can flip it on the bypass. So we're bypassing that shadow whenever the is unchecked. And when it is checked, we're allowing the shadow there. Um, then we're running this into a video mixer. Now this video mixer has 
four layers. So the topmost layer is our text. So it's coming in through here, which was just feeding us through. The second layer here is going to be our border, which we can look down here and see all right, our border is going to be a rectangle. The rectangle width is actually going to look at the composition and get the aspect ratio. And it's basically going to use that as the width of the rectangle. And the height of the rectangle will be one. So one screen unit high and the aspect ratio wide. Uh, we're using an edge here because that's a shape. We can grab an edge. And because of that, we can use a thickness down the bottom here. Again, these are yellow, so they're inputs. So we're using a border thickness just being a float in to control the border, which is over here. And just a show border boolean. You can see it flack, flicking on and off there. So what we go from there, we now have our background color fill, which is the next one down underneath. Um, and you'll notice that our border is actually the opacity of the video mixer is actually linked directly to this boolean. That's just one way I wanted to show you can control if something's turned on and off. The background color fill has something slightly differently because the color um, solid color actually has a bypass node you can turn on. So if we come into this node, um, you can see there is actually a bypass thing. You may not see it directly. So you go into visibility and make sure you turn on the bypass. And we can then put our Boolean again, one take X into the bypass. So when it's off, it's basically there. And when we have our uh, Boolean checked, we are saying allow this color fill. And there's just a the color in as well, just so we can change that color up. All right, out of the video mixer, we're running into a hub out. Again, I just like to use hubs. And then we've got the texture out, sending it back out into Regloom. All right, so that's our main um, our text line. So let's jump into our color control next. This is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. So our color controls actually also look at these floor values. So again, this is where we would just come back from uh, converting everything into seconds. We're counting it down and we've turned everything into our hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. So if we look at this top section here, we have an equal node and an equal node and a greater node. Now this is basically saying, all right, I want to look at the hours and the minutes. Now we're only ever going to change, I'm just going to restart this. We're only ever going to change the color of these um, values down here. So the color of the text when we're in the 30 seconds, the uh, more than 10 seconds and the less than 10 seconds range. So we don't need to worry about minutes, but we don't want these to trigger off when there are still say four hours left or two minutes left. And we're using um, equal nodes to grab and check whether the hours and the minutes are both equal to zero. So if they're both equal to zero, um, they're both going to come across as true. All right? So we can actually use an AND node to say, all right, this AND node will only become true if this equal, which is our hours, is equal to zero, and the minutes are also equal to zero. Okay, but let's put a third node in and say, all right, this particular one will only go true when hours are zero, minutes are zero, and the seconds as we come out here the seconds here are greater than 30. So this will become true when that becomes true at the moment i've got it into a multiplier of zero um, this is basically just to show for that top section this just means that by default it will be zero so it will always be green unless otherwise explained so let's have a look at the next and one down here so again hours and minutes are both equal to zero and we are looking at a within range. So our seconds value here is within 11 seconds and 30 seconds. That then is going to multiply by one. So when we add these values up again here, that'll be zero, that'll be a one, that'll be zero, and that'll be zero there. Um, we add this in and it'll give us a value of one. So again, we're just gonna convert that to an integer and we're gonna feed that into a gate. So apologies if that's really confusing, um, but basically the long and short of it is we're using different ands in combination with greaters, withins, less than equals to see whether we're gonna output a zero, we're gonna output a one, we're gonna output a two, 
four gonna output a three. Um, and these bottom two actually uh, blend together. So when we come across here, we're doing our ads. So let's just, for example, say we have zero minutes and say 20 seconds. Let's stop that. You can see that we have false for the top one, true for the second one, false and false. So this is going to output zero, one, zero, and zero. The total here is one. It turns into a one integer. And so case one, if we follow that down the line, is going to be yellow, which is showing here. But if we are going to go and say, look, our next one, let's just play this again. Uh, drop it down a couple extra seconds manually so it's faster. And when it gets down to the 10 range, pause it. We'll now see that the top one is zero. Bottom, next one is zero. This one here is a two. So we're doing zero, zero, two, and zero. Adding those together, we get a two. Uh, case two. Oh, sorry. Let's relink that again. So case two is actually going to be red. So the red down here is basically going to say, all right, you know, when none of these other ones are, are true, but this one here, so the and is zero hours, zero minutes, and less than 11 seconds, we're going to make it red by using this gate. And finally, down the bottom, we have another equal. So when hours are equal to zero, minutes are equal to zero, and seconds are equal to zero here, then we're going to multiply this by three. Now, the interesting thing you're going to find here, so if I let this run out, um, is that while this is true, it is also less than 11. So you're going to get both of these numbers in here. So if I pause it now here, you will see that top one is false, bottom next one is false. This is true, and this is true. So the values are two and three being added together. We actually get five. Um, now, the cases here in the gate, it's going to show us as case three is what's actually working. So the flashing one we have down here. Um, and that's just because we're overflowing it and there's nothing below it. So it's going to use the highest case value that is there. So even though we are feeding in a five instead of a three, because there is no four or five, it's just going to stop at three and say, this is the highest one for the gate. Um, that is what the, the state will be. So let's have a look at how we're doing our flashing down here. So our flashing is actually a square um, oscillator. And as you can see here, the value is going from minus one to one. There is a frequency input here that we have grabbed in the original inputs, and that is our flash speed, as we showed off at the start. We're now running this into a map, and we're doing that because we don't want a value of negative one. We just want it from zero to one. So our map actually takes the value range from negative one to one and crunches that down so it outputs a range from zero to one. Um, the next thing we're doing is we're using a multiply node. And we're grabbing the same red that we were using for the uh, less than 10 seconds remaining, feeding that into one side of the multiplier, and then feeding our value coming out from our oscillator in. So that means it's just going to turn, essentially turn on and off every um, cycle. That's running into the gate now. Again, like we said, we're grabbing case three because it's a value higher than three. And then we're taking this color value out of here and feeding it into our text render. We're also grabbing the value here and feeding it into the color of our border. So they're always going to be in sync. Okay, so before we jump into OSC, let's jump back a bit further and just have a look at some of the text formatting. So what we've done is we've grabbed, as we showed quickly earlier, uh, we're using a patch info node here. What that allows us to do is say, when this is running in something like Arena, we want to either be able to grab the name, the resolution, aspect ratio, the bit depth, um, for all that sort of thing. Um, the main things we're using here is using the resolution to come in and say how wide is our composition, and that's going to be used for our line width in the text. And then we're also going to grab our aspect ratio here, which is going to feed into that rectangle, which is going to feed our border. Let's just restart this again. Let's say five minutes just to restart it. Then we're also grabbing our spacing. So our character spacing and line spacing are both float ins. Uh, that's going into a pack and that will then feed out to our spacing input of the text renderer. Text size here is another float in. 
Um, that is then going to feed out into the size of the text render. Alignment is a choice in, which allows us to create different lines here and it'll create a drop down menu um, for us to choose from. In Arena, we we'll actually put these three side by side. So that's really cool. Uh, the drop shadow here is the Boolean. The offset X and offset Y feed into a pack. And this value actually goes out to the final transform just before the texture out, allowing us to move it around up and down. Uh, and then we have the flash speed, which before we showed was the um, value here that's going to drive the frequency of that flashing. Okay, the final section in here, the OSC section. So this is mainly used if you're controlling something externally from Regloom. So if you were using something like the uh, Zoom OSC uh, controls, um, you could then uh, trigger a value off as soon as someone, uh, their time runs out, you can cut off their camera, sort of, that sort of vibe. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the value, again, of this color control node because our bottom and is basically saying, you know, when this is zero, hours are zero, minutes are zero, and seconds are zero, well, obviously we've just ticked over to the timer is finished. So when that happens, we have the value of five, like we said before, it was the two plus the three. So that's gonna be referenced here, this integer, and this is gonna be an equal node. So this node here is saying, when that value coming in is equal to five, we have obviously run out of time on the timer, we're going to look for an on change event because this equal will turn from a zero to one. That on change actually allows us to go from something like a float or an integer and turn it into a trigger. And that trigger there uh, will come into a actual trigger node. And that can then fire off our write OSC. So what we've got here are two separate uh, branches. One branch is for floats. One branch is for integers. I tried it using a gate for these, but whatever I fed into the top would immediately change the bottom one into that type as well. So if I fed a float into the top and an integer in the bottom, it would just convert that integer into a float, which is not what we wanted. So what we're doing instead is basically setting up two completely different versions. So one is a float that runs into a gate and we have another choice one down here. So another choice in node. Um, I've got float and int as my two values. And the way this works is if I come across here and I say, I want to select my integer, which is value of one, um, it'll look at this gate here and this gate here and say, all right, if I want my integer trigger, the value that's coming from my trigger is actually in case one. So I need this to be the one, which is integer. If I trigger this off here, you can see the value comes all the way through the bottom one. So again, trigger, trigger, trigger. You can see that white flash. It doesn't trigger up the top. But if I was to switch this to float, you'll notice when I do a test trigger that the bottom here doesn't fire off, but the top does. And again, that's because it's set up so that the float here is a zero value coming to this top gate where this hub uh, trigger value is being fed into case zero. So it's the top one. So here it's at the top in zero, here it's at the bottom at one. So basically we're using this as a switch to basically say which one is which, write that OSC and then send it out. Alrighty, so just a quick overview again of how all of this works. So we have all of our inputs on the side. We have our play, pause, stop and restart buttons on the side up here. We have hours, minutes, seconds, for controlling the amount of time that we have going. We have both a green, yellow, and red, which are again, all completely color um, customizational uh, to change when uh, things move into different stages of the timer countdown. When we hit zero, it'll flash. You have the option of changing the border or hiding it. Uh, you have the ability to add in a key in the background, a background sold key for a switcher. Uh, and you can have a bunch of text parameters to move your text around, change the size, change the scaling, as well as an OSC trigger. Uh, that'll either be a float or an integer when everything hits zero. So again, back in Arena, all we need to do is drag it in, drop it on, set your time, press play, and your new timer will just function. So I hope this has been super useful. And... Uh, 
everyone out there hope that you have a fantastic new year's eve um it is currently the 31st of december 2021 as i'm uh recording this so here's to a much different 2022 hope everyone's having a good one out there cheers